Gabby Hanna has been known to be a controversial figure on YouTube. In the previous installments, I went over her promotion of a makeup scam as well as the viral monster meme in which people poked fun at a clip of her singing her own song in a genius video in which she's explaining her lyrics. Gabby's reputation had already taken some hits, but nothing would come close to the cyclone of controversy that awaited her. Almost a year after the makeup scandal, she was involved in an explosive YouTube feud that served as the catalyst for a wave of criticism that would end up shifting the public opinion against her and leaving a lasting impact on her career and reputation. While the lore runs deep, today we're going to set our sights on the beef that seemingly started it all. Before we go any further, I want to make one thing clear. The intention of this video is not to stir up drama, but rather to bring perspective to a situation that I feel wasn't done justice to in its coverage. There are still false narratives and misconceptions people have about it, mostly perpetuated by T-channels, and I believe there's a lot we can learn. Furthermore, I am not signing off on every single thing Gabby Hanna has ever said and done. While I do believe a lot of her controversies are overblown, misrepresented, and unfairly covered, if I was to go over everything, I would have to spend the rest of my life doing that. Just try to go into this video with an open mind and look at the situation for what it is. I'll be adding timestamps in the description, since this is going to be a long one. Now, with that being said, get ready, because we're about to take a very deep dive. Gabby Hanna, if you want this attention and you think I just want to talk so much about you, this is it. A new challenger approaches. Enter Trisha Paytas. Now, I have to give a quick disclaimer since I know this will come up. So, listen to the whole disclaimer before you comment. Trisha wants to be referred to using they, them pronouns, so I'm gonna do that. I'm letting you know this to avoid any potential confusion regarding my narration. Throughout this video, you'll hear people refer to Trisha with she, her pronouns. But it's important to note that Trisha also goes by those pronouns. They, them is a great umbrella term. For me, I prefer I like it, but again, I am also fine with she, her, or he, him. I'm mainly using they, them pronouns because during the time of making this video, Trisha temporarily removed she, her from their bio. So I had to re-record everything. And then they put it back a week later. And there's no way I'm gonna change all that again. Also, I know there's people who falsely accuse others of misgendering Trisha, even though Trisha goes by female pronouns, and I'd rather not deal with that. Now, with that being said, let's get down to business. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Trisha Paytas, they're quite the character. They are known to be a huge troll, whose career has been full of drama and controversy. And in an alternate universe, they're probably somewhere in a rap battle. Coming at you at supersonic speed. But what do they have to do with Gabby? Allow me to tell you a story involving a famous YouTuber relationship, a certain disease, and one of the most painfully awkward situations you can be involved in. A few years ago, Trisha was dating Jason Nash. You may know him from David Dobrik's Vlog Squad, which Gabby was once a part of. One day, Gabby told Jason something quite concerning she had heard about Trisha. What did she say? Well, she claimed that she had been told by a close friend of Trisha that Trisha had herpes. According to Gabby's account of events, she suggested that Jason have a conversation about it with Trisha. However, it would later appear that Trisha did not have herpes at all. In a video they made about the situation, Trisha said they were upset that Gabby said this, and they later cited this incident as the main reason they don't want anything to do with Gabby. Here's Gabby telling her side of the story in a video she uploaded more than six months after the initial herpes drama. So when Jason told me as a friend sitting on my bed in my apartment, I felt the need to say something. And I never said that Trisha has herpes and now Jason Nash has herpes. What I said was I was told by a close friend of hers and I don't know why he would have a reason to lie to me that she has herpes. I don't know if it's true. Get checked if you're concerned about it, but have the conversation with her. Gabby would also reveal that David Dobrik was also there, a fact which was not disclosed at first. More on that later. Public opinion was fairly divided on Gabby's decision to tell Jason. And even when I discussed the situation with other people, people were generally divided into two sides. Some people agreed with Gabby's decision and believed that she was just trying to be a good friend by passing on potentially important information to Jason. Interestingly enough, YouTuber Smokey Glow made a Twitter poll, saying, 
This might be an unpopular opinion, but if I thought my friend was having sex with someone who possibly had an STD that I thought wasn't disclosed, I would 100% say something. Probably wouldn't be blunt, but like, I would want to make sure they were aware. What would you do? And according to the poll results, an overwhelming majority of people, 93%, would tell them, while only around 7% would keep their mouths shut. But although some people thought Gabby did the right thing, the majority of people believed that Gabby should have just minded her own business. After all, Trisha and Jason are adults, and their sexual health, aside from being a very private matter, is ultimately their own responsibility. Furthermore, it could be hurtful if someone was treating an STD and discussed it with their partner, only to find that someone else did it on their behalf. More than a year and a half later, Gabby would say that she wanted to warn Jason because people lie about STDs and she was already suspicious of Trisha. Here's the clip of her explanation. Yeah, adults should be adults. It's between two adults. People f***ing lie. That's why it spreads. That's why it's important. This was another reason I wanted to warn Jason, actually. Because you were already lying to him. And this was a big part of the story that I've never said because it's like... Because I'm not mean. <laughs> Whenever Trisha texted me when we were friends, she passed that one vlog squad billboard and she was like, what was this billboard? The only people I knew on there were you and Jason Nash. And then she was talking about Jason's vines, but then later when they started dating, she had this whole thing of like, I've never heard of Jason. I've never seen his videos. And that weirded me out. So when I found out you had unprotected sex with him, I was like, hey, heads up. Because you were telling him you didn't know who he was and you did. And that's f***ed up, dude. That's f***ed up. For real. Gabby and Trisha had talked about the situation before, which Gabby shared on her Instagram story. In this screenshot, you can see Trisha texted Gabby this. I don't have herpes. If I did, I'd be an open book about it. And if I did, it's also no one's business but mine and my partner's. To which Gabby responded, I didn't tell him you had herpes. I told him a very close person to you told me you did. And I told him to make sure he's safe, which is what a good friend would do. Prior to posting that conversation, Gabby went on Instagram stories and made a poll asking her own Instagram followers if they think she did the right thing. Though people pointed out that the results would be biased since her fans already like her. At this point, she didn't mention Trisha by name. All I'm saying is I've been being painted as a villain for two, a year, two years, I don't know how long, because I knew somebody was sleeping with someone who I wasn't close with her, I was close with him and I heard that she had an incurable STD. He told me he slept with her. I literally said, hey, this person I've heard has this incurable STD and if you're going to continue sleeping with her, ask her about it. Don't know if it's true. A close friend of hers told me. That's all I know. Be careful. Keep an eye out. Use protection. She continued to discuss the situation. I usually try to keep shit like this like pretty private. It's just I'm at a place in my life where I'm so f***ing happy like I have great people in my life like my friendships, my love life, like my house, my career, like everything's great and I'm so secure in myself and who I am at this point that I'm so done with bullshit and I'm so sick of like the shit I hear that I've said or done like coming back to me and just like hearing the things that like people make up. I am somebody who not to toot my own horn, but beep the f***ing beep. I am so kind to people in my life. I will reach out to you if you're hurting, whether you're awful to me, if I hear all the terrible things you say about me, if you've killed my f***ing pet. If I see you're having a hard time, I will reach out to you and I will say, I'm here for you. Regardless of whether or not what she said was true, it came off to many people as needlessly self-congratulatory and arrogant, and provided ammunition for her critics. It's clear that Gabby seems to be at least somewhat self-aware of how this comes off, since she herself says this. Not to toot my own horn, but beep the f***ing beep. But she just does it anyway. Not a huge deal, but also not a very good look. Shortly after, Trisha uploaded a video titled Why I Don't Trust Gabby Hanna, which escalated the situation by making it public. It's important to note that the video was uploaded before Gabby made any posts on her Instagram story that could have been discerned to be about Trisha. But we'll get to that in a little bit. The video can be mainly summarized as Trisha ranting about how Gabby told Jason they had herpes. When me and Jason started hooking up in 2017, I did a video called like YouTubers I've hooked up with. She, by the clues, guessed that I was hooking up with Jason. I was. She texted Jason and she told Jason, or I guess, I don't know if she texted him or told him in person, but basically she told him, hey, be careful, Trish has herpes and you're sleeping with her and blah, blah, blah. Gabby. 
Have we slept together? Did I show you my STD results? Ha are you my doctor? Did you swab my vag- An important distinction to make is that according to Gabby, she never said Trisha had herpes. Gabby would state that she simply told Jason she heard from a friend of Trisha's that Trisha might have herpes. I never said that Trisha has herpes and now Jason Nash has herpes. What I said was, I was told by a close friend of hers, and I don't know why he would have a reason to lie to me, that she has herpes. I don't know if it's true. Get checked if you're concerned about it, but have the conversation with her. This friend was later said to be Shane Dawson, but more on that later. You might be wondering how Gabby knows Trisha and Jason did the frick in the first place. That's because Jason told her. I was with David Dobrik and Jason Nash. They were in my apartment and Jason told me that he had slept with Trisha. This is worth bringing up because Trisha made the claim that Gabby merely guessed that they were hooking up with Jason. I did a video called like YouTubers I've hooked up with. She, by the clues, guessed that I was hooking up with Jason. When according to Gabby, Jason told her. And if that's true, then there's a significant difference between just snooping around based on a guess and telling a close friend of yours something when it felt necessary to do so. In the beginning of the video, Trisha tells us why they're making it. I am making this video today for one reason and one reason only is because I want this drama to stop. This person keeps thinking I am talking shit about them. I get constant texts. Look, here's the thing. First and foremost, yes. She's a freaking drama queen, I'm a freaking drama queen. So I'm gonna just put this out there and tell it my issues with her because I keep texting her telling me to leave me alone that I literally never think about her and she literally responded, you talk about me all the time. I don't think about her ever. Keep this in mind for later. In addition to the herpes incident, Trisha also takes issue with how Gabby frequently wants to know if they are saying bad things about her. One time she texted me because she thought I was throwing shade at her through a video because I said someone asked for my address and I'm not friends with them and it wasn't the she was it wasn't her that I was talking about it was like someone else that I didn't know but she like thinks everything is about her everything's about her well Gabby no this is about you so there you go you want the attention you think I only talk about you and everything's about you this is a story that happened years ago and I'm gonna tell it now because this is my only issue with Gabby Hanna this is the only thing I've ever said to people I've said it to people about her when they bring her up and I said this is why I don't trust Gabby Hanna that's it Trisha also stated that they were an open book about their sexual health. I am an open book. I will tell people what I have, when I have, when I have sex with them. And Trisha also alludes to how other people have issues with Gabby as well. There's so many stories I've heard, and this is just my story I'm telling you. Everyone else's story, they can remain anonymous if that's how they want to do, keep out of drama. I get it, because also me, I don't want to have drama with this person. She has drama with everybody too, so it's like, I get it. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to be that, but I've heard so many stories. There are so many untold stories. This is something that Trisha would bring up in the future. The stories I've heard about her is evil. The voice memos I've heard her leave people are terrifying. The video was a huge deal when it came out, and most people sided with Trisha and criticized Gabby. Whether you think Gabby was right or wrong in her decision to tell Jason about what she had heard, that's up to you to decide. But while most of the discussion surrounding the situation was about Gabby's decision to tell Jason that she heard from a friend of Trisha, later found out to be Shane, that Trisha had herpes, there's a bigger issue here that not many people seem to be talking about. When Trisha made their video, people were quick to take their side, even people who don't typically support Trisha. You can tell from comments such as, you know there's a problem when Trisha starts making sense and spitting hard facts, and I'm not a fan of Trish, but this is the only time she sounds like a sane person. I'm glad she spoke up. As well as some comments about how Trisha is simply speaking too fast to be lying. With this much public support behind them, it would seem that their account of events is accurate and reliable. Except, here's the problem. The facts don't line up. There I was, in the bowels of Insert City here, looking for any bit of evidence I could muster. Until one day, I came across a gold mine. Ah yes, just what I needed. When you actually dig into the situation, the facts paint a different story than were let on. Let's try to understand the complete context of the situation. We have to ask, how and why did such a private matter become public knowledge in the first place? One prominent narrative people seem to latch onto was that Gabby was the one who directly instigated the drama by talking about Trisha on her Instagram story and not properly blurring out their name. Trisha makes this claim multiple times. You are so scary delusional. The fact that you don't think you started any drama, you, there's all your Instagram story of you starting the drama by sharing my name in them. But to say <laughs> you don't call people's name on start drama when there is Instagrams of the day, the, the 
morning before I posted my video, the only reason I had to address you publicly, which I hate because you were so scary to me, beyond scary, in fact, that you can't rationalize with a delusional person. I never finished watching this because this is the same podcast where she lied about never saying my name and never starting drama. She made everything about me public before I ever made a video or mentioned her name. She made everything about me public before I ever made a video or mentioned her name. However, this is verifiably false. Using a tool from Amnesty International called YouTube Data Viewer, we can confirm that Trisha's first video about Gabby, which was titled, Why I Don't Trust Gabby Hanna, was uploaded at 2.42 a.m. Coordinated Universal Time. And if you convert that to Pacific Standard Time, which is the time zone in Los Angeles where Gabby and Trisha both live, you get 6.42 p.m., since Daylight Savings Time had already ended a little less than a week before. But when did Gabby make the post on her Instagram story where she didn't blur out Trisha's name? The part where Gabby doesn't censor Trisha's name is in this screenshot of a text conversation they had. However, you can see that the screenshot was taken at 7.49. And even if Gabby posted this to Instagram the same exact minute she took the screenshot, that would still be more than an hour after Trisha already uploaded the video. And when looking at an archive of Gabby's Instagram stories that day, the earliest instance of Gabby posting something to her story where you can figure out she's talking about Trisha, in my opinion, is the second screenshot she posted with a timestamp 714. Gabby didn't completely censor Trisha's picture here, so you can probably figure out she's talking about them. This doesn't exactly line up with what Trisha was talking about, since Trisha specifically mentions Gabby not censoring their name, which we'll get to in a bit. But I thought it was worth pointing out, since even in this screenshot, you can see that it was taken at 7.14, more than half an hour after Trisha uploaded their video. And you can probably figure out from the post on her story before this, since Gabby didn't censor the N and Jason. So if you already had suspicions that she was talking about Trisha, this would be another piece to the puzzle. There's another screenshot like this where Trisha's picture isn't fully censored. However, although any revealing posts to Gabby's story were posted after Trisha's video, Gabby did start talking about the situation before Trisha uploaded their video. But at this point, she didn't mention any names, and she was just talking about the situation. But could it be possible that Trisha saw Gabby's Instagram rant and then decided to make a video calling her out? I don't think so, and here's why. Now, this part of the timeline can get tricky, but I'll do the best I can. As we already established, the first instance of Gabby posting something on her Instagram story that can be discerned to be about Trisha has a timestamp of 7.14pm, more than half an hour after Trisha's video went up. There were three screenshots with a timestamp of 7.14, followed by one screenshot with a timestamp of 7.22. The one after that, where Gabby left Trisha's name uncensored, reads 7.49. In other words, all of the posts on Gabby's story that you can tell were about Trisha were uploaded after Trisha's video. So, what gives? Before Gabby posted screenshots of her text messages with Trisha, she did talk about the situation for a few minutes on her story. Although she never mentioned Trisha by name, is it still possible that Trisha saw her rant and then got riled up enough to make the video? I also don't think so, and here's why. First, in order to determine if this is true, we would have to reverse engineer our way to find out when Gabby started talking about it on her Instagram story. Now, we're gonna have to do some math, so sit tight and buckle your seatbelts. Now, I know what some of you wise guys are thinking, haha, the Asian man is gonna do math for us. I don't call myself Dr. Chris PhD for nothing. Thankfully, a YouTube user known as Bree uploaded a screen recording of Gabby's Instagram story around this time complete with Instagram's timestamps showing when they were posted. I could not find any evidence that Gabby posted anything else on that day besides what's included here. It's also worth noting that this timeline isn't 100% accurate, since time is passing as the screen is being recorded, so there's bound to be a slight disparity of maybe a few minutes. For instance, over a minute passes in the screen recording between the screenshots with a stamp of 714 that were actually posted at 718 and the screenshot at 749. And it looks like the difference between them is only 30 minutes, when it's actually 31. And of course, there's a certain margin of error since we don't know the exact second something is posted. And so it could also be off by a few minutes, since all anyone can really do is round to the closest minute based on the information we have. It's also important to note that when we start trying to calculate the exact times of each post, some slight inconsistencies begin to arise. There are two main reasons for this. 
First, there's a slight difference in time between when Gabby took the screenshot and when Gabby decided to upload it on Instagram. And second, the person who took the screen recording pauses the posts with a lot of text in them, so that you can read them. Also, the screen recording lasts almost 8 minutes. And so it's impossible to truly get an accurate timestamp of each post, since, as I said, time is literally passing as the screen is being recorded. And there's no way around that. I mean, you could record yourself just skipping past each post, but that would defeat the purpose of recording it for people to see. And the person recording this probably didn't think someone would be analyzing this years later like it's a crime scene. For instance, looking at the time difference between the first set of screenshots dated 714 and the story right after which is dated 722, we can notice that there's only a 4 minute difference in posting times, where there should be 8 minutes. And if we look at the difference between the story dated 722 and the one dated 749, the difference in posting times is 26 minutes, while the difference in the screenshots is 27 minutes, which means there's a minute missing. Now, if we look at the screen recording, it shows that when Gabby posted the screenshot with a timestamp of 749, that was shown as being 21 minutes ago at that point in the screen recording. That would mean it was about 810 for the person who was recording. So, how can we use this to get an approximation of when exactly Gabby started talking about the situation? Well, that's where a little studio engineering comes in handy, my hard rockin' amigo! Let's now examine the screen recording itself and go back seven minutes, which is when it started. This would bring us to the first time Gabby talked about the situation. Because we're going back seven minutes, we can subtract seven from our approximate time of 810, leaving us with 803. Now, as we can see, Instagram shows Gabby's post as being uploaded around two hours ago. However, when you get past the one hour mark, Instagram starts to round its time. Let me explain. I wanted to see when exactly Instagram starts rounding to two hours. So I decided to test this by posting an Instagram story myself at around 8.48 p.m. I checked back at 10.14 p.m., four minutes before an hour and a half later and it still showed it as being posted one hour ago. However, at 10.18pm, which was an hour and a half later, Instagram rounded it to two hours ago. Therefore, it's safe to say that Instagram would list something posted two and a half hours ago as being posted three hours ago, and so on and so forth. So, this would put the approximate time Gabby started talking about the situation somewhere in the range between 5.33 and 6.33. However, there is a way we can get a closer approximation. A Twitter user by the name of posted a screen recording of Gabby's Instagram story which shows that it was posted 22 minutes ago. She also supplied this screenshot showing that her recording was dated 10.36pm. She stated that the screenshot was in Atlantic Standard Time, which would make it 6.36pm in Pacific Standard Time. If we subtract 22 minutes from 6.36pm, we arrive at 6.14pm. It's also worth pointing out that the clip she posted is already around 2 minutes and 40 seconds into Gabby's Instagram rant. So, if we subtract at least 2 minutes, we get 6.12pm. Also, this video was saved from Snapchat since the person who recorded it also added a caption. So, if we subtract 1 minute to account for that, that means that it was around 6.11pm when Gabby started talking about the situation on Instagram. Remember, Trisha's video was officially publicly released at 6.42. Now, let's assume that Trisha saw Gabby's post the exact minute it was posted. And to give them even more time, let's also assume they did not watch the whole rant, which was several minutes long. We also need to consider that it's not very likely Trisha saw it as soon as it went up if what they said here is true. My friend from Boston came out to stay with me because like, I had cops here at my house. Like I have just so much shit happening. I have never been more upset. My friend just got here from Boston and I was like boiling on the couch. I'm like, I'm sorry. Like I just have to put this out here. The video was around 14 and a half minutes, but there are a couple of jump cuts in the video. So let's just say it took 15 minutes to film. 612 plus 15 would put you at 627. There was also a little bit of editing in the video, since as I mentioned, there are jump cuts. While the act of editing out a small portion of the video wouldn't take very long, the fact that they had to edit it at all most likely means that they had to render the video. It's also likely that Trisha had to watch at least some parts of the video in order to know where to add the jump cuts. So let's just say they watched at least half of the video. In that case, let's add 7 minutes. This puts us at 634. 
Now keep in mind that the video is around 14 and a half minutes, and it was uploaded in 1080p, one of the highest definitions a video can be. Because of these two factors alone, it would take a little bit to render. It would also depend on how big the original file was, as well as Trisha's computer and editing software. I tried rendering Trisha's video at 1080p on two of my computers. They took an average of about 27 minutes to render. I also had fellow YouTuber Hootendow render it on his computer, and it took him almost 28 minutes. So let's say it took Trisha 20 minutes to render. This would put us at 654. Trisha would then have to upload the video to YouTube. It's hard to estimate how long this would take, as it would depend on Trisha's internet speed. But I decided to test it myself by uploading this exact video in 1080p. Here's my upload speed while I was doing it. On my first run, it took around 10 minutes for the video to be uploaded and fully processed on YouTube. Though this is not counting HD processing. So let's just add 10 minutes to our time, since that's a nice even number. This would put us at a final time of 7.04, more than 20 minutes after Trisha uploaded the video. This isn't even considering that Trisha likely had to wait for the video files to transfer from their camera to their computer in order to edit them. And I don't know the specifics regarding Trisha's equipment, but I can tell you from first-hand experience that it's not a very fast process. Knowing all of this, it's very hard to believe that it was Gabby's Instagram stories that made Trisha make a video on her. What probably happened was, after their heated argument, both Trisha and Gabby decided to vent their frustrations online, and Gabby ended up going on Instagram at the same time Trisha was filming their video. However, interestingly enough, Ashley Kyle made a video titled, Trisha Paytas Comes for Gabby Hanna and Gabby Responds, in which Ashley says that Gabby's rant on Instagram stories took place two hours before Trisha uploaded their video. Gabby Hanna actually had went on her Instagram rant, quote unquote, two hours before Trisha Paytas's video went live. This is, of course, false, as we have proven. Other drama channels who reported on this confirmed that Gabby started discussing the situation on Instagram stories before Trisha's video. In a now deleted video by Dustin Daly, he confirms that Gabby went on the Instagram rant first. Gabby had actually posted an Instagram story where she didn't name Trisha, and no one would have actually had known about Trisha allegedly having herpes if they were not privy to this whole story. I literally only knew this because Trisha told me this story when I hung out with her when I was in LA, and I'll get a little bit more into that after this. And in Nick Snyder's video, he also confirms this. And then of course, people thought it was shady that just two hours before Trisha Paytas dropped her video about not trusting Gabby Hanna, Gabby Hanna went on her Instagram stories and did kind of a five minute rant. So when Trisha claims that Gabby started the drama by sharing their name on Instagram, You starting the drama by sharing my name in them. We can definitively say that this is not true. And when we hear YouTubers say stuff like this, She started and instigated that entire situation. A hundred percent of that was Gabby. We now know that this is a false narrative. In fact, when you actually watch Trisha's video, there isn't a single mention of this being the case. You know, since it didn't actually happen yet. Instead, let's listen again to the actual reasons Trisha gave in the video. I am making this video today for one reason and one reason only is because I want this drama to stop. This person keeps thinking I am talking shit about them. I get constant texts. So I'm gonna just put this out there and tell it my issues with her because I keep texting her telling me to leave me alone. Contrast this with what Trisha would say later on and how definitively they pin Gabby as the instigator. There is Instagrams of the day, the, the morning before I posted my video. The only reason I had to address you publicly, which I me because you were so scary to me. The only reason I had to address you publicly. But no matter how much Trisha vehemently insists otherwise, the facts simply do not support their claim that Gabby started the drama on Instagram. And Trisha would make another contradiction in a video in September 2020, where Trisha claims that the reason they made the first video was because Gabby talked about them in a podcast. She keeps bringing up my name in the podcast, which is why I did the first video. The podcast in which Gabby talks about them was uploaded in June 2020, while Trisha's first video about Gabby was uploaded in November 2019. So, which is it? Did they make the video because they just wanted the drama to end? Or was it because Gabby started it on Instagram, a claim I've already debunked? 
Or was it because Gabby talked about them in a podcast that didn't even exist at the time? Since the first episode of that podcast aired on November 26th, 2019, and the specific episode Trisha is referring to didn't exist until seven months later. And there's something else that doesn't quite line up. In the beginning of their video, Trisha claims they only met Gabby on two occasions. I've met this person on two occasions. On two occasions I met this person. One time when she asked to come to my birthday party and I said yes. I talked to her for two seconds at my birthday party. And actually I think that's the only time I ever met her. Oh, and at Joey Graceffa's Secret Santa party last year. Those were the only two times I've met this YouTuber. Trisha claims that the first time they ever met Gabby was at their birthday party in 2017. However, that doesn't line up with this tweet they made after their birthday party, in which they say, Every time me and the Gabby show are together, we never get selfies, and it makes me extremely depressed. You wouldn't use the phrase every time about someone you only met once. Also, even though Trisha acknowledged in their first video that Gabby was at their birthday party, Trisha also had this to say in another video posted shortly after. The one thing she said was like, Trisha invited me to her party, which for a fact, I don't have DMs or text messages that old. Like, I, I could show you guys. I tried to scroll and I could not scroll anymore. I don't know how she got text messages from literally three years ago. It was my 29th birthday party. And I wish I could go back into like the DMs, but like our DMs with her, like start from this year. And there's a lot that she unsent because I was like going, to, I, was re I was like, wow, she cut a lot of stuff out. But I was like, there's no way in hell I'm going to just randomly invite people I don't know to my birthday party. However, Gabby has this screenshot which shows that she was sent an invitation. Additionally, there was some discussion about whether Gabby asked to come to the party like Trisha claims. She asked to come to my birthday party and I said yes. Or if she was invited. Gabby tweeted, I didn't ask to come to your party. I was very thankful to be invited though. And posted a screenshot showing that Trisha sent her an invitation and told her RSVP if you can come. However, some people still didn't think the screenshot definitively proved anything, and that maybe Trisha was just being nice. But there's also this video of Trisha saying they loved everyone at their party and that they don't just invite random people. Y'all were at my party, that means I care about you, that I like you. I don't just invite random people I don't like, especially to my party. Like, no, like, if you were there, I love you guys. There are a couple more things to note. First of all, RSVP, if you can come, is kind of a strange thing to say to somebody who asked to be invited. Unless Trisha just copy and pasted the same message to everyone else. Second, what situation would they have had to be in for Gabby to ask for an invitation? Did she text Trisha to ask for one? That's not very likely, since there's no evidence available to support that and Trisha didn't do anything to counter what Gabby said. Were they hanging out? Again, we don't know. Something else that contradicts Trisha's claim that they only met twice is that Trisha and Gabby can briefly be seen interacting at Joey Graceffa's birthday party in June 2017. You may think this is a reach from this clip alone, but we'll get to that interaction in a bit. This might just seem like a petty inconsistency, but it's still something worth keeping in mind, since it's a part of the larger narrative Trisha's trying to weave about how one-sided their friendship supposedly always was. Mentioning that they've only met twice can make Gabby's perceived wrongdoing appear even worse, by painting her as someone who's willing to spread harmful rumors about a person she doesn't even know. I do want to acknowledge the possibility that this may have just been an oversight on Trisha's end, rather than a malicious lie. But with that being said, the effect is the same. Trisha painted Gabby as a crazed neurotic person who was constantly sending them unwelcome texts and getting involved in their business. There are also some other tweets from Trisha that show that at the very least, their perception of Gabby was more than just someone they met two times and barely interacted with. Such as this tweet in which they say, My obsession with the Gabby show lately has been unreal. Like, I don't even understand. Like, she's actually the most amazing thing on YouTube now. And this tweet where she says, Legit gonna buy a VIP ticket to your show. Like, yes, yes, yes. Gabby also leaked this screenshot of a text conversation she had with Trisha, in which Trisha even says, I'm tired of the internet not knowing we are friends. This was said in the context of Trisha finding out that Gabby would be at Joey Graceffa's party, and this is backed up by the footage I showed earlier. This is very likely what Trisha was referring to when they mentioned in a recent video called Gabby Please Stop that Gabby remembered the third time they had met. Gabby and I have seen each other in person twice, like, I, I guess there was like a third time she remembered at like a birthday party or something. They also once called Gabby the nicest, sweetest person they have ever known and met. 
Gabby is, without a doubt, the sweetest, like nicest, like non-confrontational person like I've ever known and met. She's just so lovely, tries to stay out of drama, just tries to be nice. And that's not even mentioning the multiple other instances in the past of Trisha and Gabby having some pretty friendly interactions. So it's not unreasonable for Gabby to have assumed that they were friends at some point in the past. Also, Trisha hasn't exactly been consistent in what they say. She says she has no friends to Gabby Hanna. She doesn't want friends. I have no friends, so I can't relate. Yes, uh, you do. Ooh, we have friends, babe. Next thing you see, she has all sorts of friends. 10 plus years of friends. I've had friends for a very long time. I have friendships that have lasted well over 10 years and I'm still friends with. That's why I have no friends. And that's why people rotate out in my life every few Whoa. months. And here's what Trisha had to say about saying they have no friends. When I say I have no friends, that's a lot of me just not wanting to reach out to these people because I don't want to burden them. In the episode of Gabby's podcast in which she and Trisha are talking to each other and squashing their beef, Gabby would mention the tweet about them not taking selfies when they hang out. This podcast episode was uploaded in February 2021, nearly four years after the tweet was posted. Basically, Gabby mentions this tweet along with some other stuff she remembered them saying, but Trisha denies it. You would send me tags like about how like, oh, I bought this shirt because you wore it in your video. I bought this necklace because you wore it in your video. Oh, and, like, damn, okay. Like you've like tweeted before that like, every time me and Gabby hang out, we never get a selfie together. And I'm like, like we're, we were friends. I, I thought- are, I Maybe these are like Photoshop tweets because I definitely never said that. No, they're that. still up. <laughs> I need to see these tweets. There's no way I tweeted that. We'll look them up after. And I'm not yeah. saying that in a mean way because like I just know yeah. myself. I'm just not about hanging out with people. Now it's completely plausible that Trisha might've just forgotten that they tweeted this. But what's suspicious about this is that Trisha deleted this tweet shortly after the podcast was posted. I actually thought about this and considered that maybe Trisha just didn't want the drama to be dragged out any longer. But even if that was the reason, Gabby now looks like the one who's wrong, when that's just not the case. Good thing it's archived, link in the description. According to Gabby, one of the reasons she didn't feel like she should talk to Trisha about the herpes rumor was that Trisha had already stopped responding to her at that point, which would imply that they already had a problem with Gabby before this incident. At this point, Trisha had long since stopped answering my texts for a reason that I didn't know because we didn't talk about it. And I didn't feel like we had a relationship where I should or could text her about this situation and ask her about it. It didn't seem any type of appropriate to text a girl who doesn't want to talk to you, hey, just so you know, I heard you have herpes and you slept with my friend. It just, I, I just don't know how that conversation would go, I guess. This contradicts the reason Trisha gave for why they had a problem with Gabby, which was that it was because of this incident. I have one issue with Gabby Hanna. This is a story that happened years ago and I'm gonna tell it now because this is my only issue with Gabby Hanna. This is the only thing I've ever said to people. Gabby would later reveal that before the herpes incident, Trisha already had a problem with her because of a bad experience at Joey Graceffa's birthday party. Here's what Gabby had to say about this. The second time we met, it was Joey's surprise party. Dude, I was so excited to hang out with Trisha at that party and I could not have made it clearer. Like when I walked in, I was like, oh my God, I'm so excited to see you. We're finally hanging out. And she was like, oh my God, me too. She left within like the first 45 minutes of the party like starting. So then I asked Daniel or Joey or someone where she went and then they were like, oh yeah, she went home because she felt uncomfortable or something. So then I texted her. I think I texted her a couple different times because I felt so bad because dude, I hate when people feel like out of place. I was really sad that you uh, left the party early. Felt like maybe you felt like you didn't know people there or something, which also me too. I was kind of out of my element. I thought anything to upset you, I'm sorry. And I was really looking forward to hanging out with you at Joey's party. Then she went on Shane's podcast and talked shit about it again. Losers who got lucky. And that's what I want to remind all the YouTubers who treat me like shit at parties. You're losers who got lucky. And then from there, she just like was different to me. And she just decided I was like um, a shitty person, I guess. If this was like a private thing, I could handle it. But it's public. So like my public persona is I'm obsessed with Trisha Paytas and I'm a liar and that I am a stalker. Like, no, that's up. I literally wanted to kill myself. Gabby also wrote this in another video. When Jason came over that June, Trisha had been ignoring me for over a month, was speaking badly about me to others, and I no longer considered us friends. It was also during that time that Jason had told Gabby that he and Trisha had slept together. And because Gabby didn't consider Trisha her friend, she didn't go to Trisha about the rumor, and instead decided to tell Jason. Whether you think Gabby made the right call or not when she told Jason, it's kinda weird to expect Gabby to go directly to Trisha, someone who dislikes her, to verify rumors of them having herpes. 
People also pointed out that Trisha is very open about their life and has been open about STDs in the past. Then I start getting STDs. Oh. So I had found out I got had HPV. That was the first STD I've ever had when I was like 18. I found out HPV was when I was on those sugar daddy websites and stuff. And because Gabby didn't publicly reveal the identity of the person who told her at the time, some people doubted that she was telling the truth. Adamant that any real friend of Trisha's wouldn't disclose such personal information to Gabby. Which is an especially weak argument because people can betray the trust of their friends. It sucks, but it happens. But where did Gabby hear that Trisha had herpes anyway? When the drama started, Trisha had this to say about Gabby's claim that she heard it from a close friend of Trisha's. And she keeps telling me a close friend of yours told me. Tell me who? Bitch, tell me who? What close friend? I, I don't think I have any close friends. Last I checked, I have no friends. I'm that friendless bitch on YouTube, and I guess I keep making videos like this. I'll continue to be a friendless bitch, and that's just what it is. We've already established that Trisha has made contradictory statements about whether or not they have friends. friends for a very long time. I have friendships that have lasted well over 10 years and I'm still friends with. In this clip from Frenemies, dated September 29th, 2020, Trisha says this. Then she tried to blame it on like Shane telling her that I had herpes, which that's not true, but she tried to blame him because she's crazy. But although Trisha dismissed what Gabby said at first, they eventually seemed to come around to it. I've always heard, like, Gabby Hanna had told, said that she that he was the one that told her I had herpes. Dustin Daly, like, anyone could verif verify that information. So why would Shane tell her that? You because they were really close at the time that I was, like, in the, pff, whatever, David's femme group and whatever, and him and Gabby were close. Trisha also mentioned in a video that they confronted Shane about it. And then when I confronted him about the Gabby thing, maybe, like, nine months ago, ten months ago, and he goes, oh, I don't remember saying that to her. Like, I can't, like... I don't think so. Not no, well, no, I would never. This would also be supported by the fact that in an episode of Gabby's podcast in which they were a guest, Trisha recalls this. And then when I hear from just so many people like, oh, he said this, this, and this and stuff, it's like not triggering, it's just more shocking. I think I brought your name up because like obviously that's what I heard it from Dustin, like, I don't know, six months ago. And then when I brought it up to Shane, he did say, well, I don't remember telling Gabby. Not like I never tell Gabby, but like, I don't remember. And I was like, why, why would you even say it? It's so weird. Furthermore, in an episode of the Dish with Trish podcast in which they're interviewing Simon Rex, they had this to say. If you don't want to do something, this is your time to get out of any plans. <laughs> right. Like a guy calls you up that you don't want to hang out with. He's like, uh, can we go out again? Corona, bro. Oh, I like that. Right? I used to just say I had herpes. I was like, I have herpes. Oh, that's a good out. <laughs> yeah. That's a good but out. It Corona help. herpes. <laughs> so it's easy to see how this rumor could have made its way to Gabby. This clip was from June 2020. And Trisha did say this is something they used to do. Trisha said that they didn't have herpes, but if they did, then it wouldn't be anyone's business but theirs and their partners. I don't have herpes. If I did, I'd be an open book about it. And if I did, it's also no one's business but mine and my partners. However, Trisha tweeted out in 2017, Remember the time I f Anthony Michael Hall for five years and he kept giving me STDs? But on the contrary, Trisha also said this a little bit earlier. You don't talk about sexual health to anybody. Like, no matter how, like, unless we... Gabby, and you caught something, for, which is not, it's just not the case. Here, they give specific conditions in which it would be acceptable to talk about sexual health. The key word here is unless. Like, unless we Gabby, and you caught something, for, which is not, it's just not the case. And if we go by this statement alone, then Trisha's tweet about Anthony Michael Hall would fit under the criteria they provide here, as they do claim to have had sex with him and to have contracted STDs as a result. Nevertheless, Trisha still contradicted what they said here around 20 seconds later when they said that if they had herpes, it would be nobody's business but theirs and their partners. But if you thought the situation would end there, wait till I tell you how Gabby DiMartino was involved. Who we'll just refer to as DiMartino since things are confusing enough with only one Gabby. If you're not familiar with DiMartino, she's a fashion, beauty, and lifestyle YouTuber. At the start of November 2019, Trisha was invited as a guest on DiMartino's show Blood Queens. Afterwards, Gabby texted DiMartino, writing, OMG, did my name ever come up with Trisha? You have to tell me, Lamal. She talks so much shit about me. And this is where the problems begin. As it turns out, Trisha actually did speak negatively about Gabby. But DiMartino lied to Gabby about the occurrence, inadvertently antagonizing Trisha as a result. DiMartino would later release a master's thesis explaining her side of the story in great detail. Now, I'm not going to read out all of this. This isn't reading Rainbow, but I will summarize the most important parts. 
According to her, Gabby asked her if Trisha said anything, and if she could ask Trisha about it. DiMartino said no at first, but Gabby told her the reason she was asking was because she was hearing a lot of stuff lately and wanted to ask Trisha why and clear the air. So DiMartino told Gabby it was fine to bring it up to Trisha as long as Gabby didn't say her name, which she didn't. This is backed up by this screenshot of a text conversation between Gabby and DiMartino, in which DiMartino says to Gabby, I mean, you can do what you want, but send my screenshot if you say anything. She didn't want Gabby to be upset, so she decided to lie to her by saying Trisha thought that she didn't like her. But although DiMartino was trying to de-escalate the situation, it backfired horribly. While on the surface, this may seem less severe than what Trisha actually said, I can see why this would be Gabby's tipping point. And she even said she's about to snap. She was already bothered by how Trisha would constantly badmouth her, but to hear DiMartino say Trisha thought that it was Gabby who didn't like her must have been baffling and upsetting to hear. Since Gabby has been kind, supportive, and compassionate to them over the years, and would even continue to do so after this incident, despite Trisha repeatedly insulting and mocking her in the coming months. Gabby, you are a monster. You are the scariest, scariest monster on the internet. You are a crackhead. You are the biggest crackhead monster, actual evil scum of the internet. However, let's not get ahead of ourselves here. We'll talk about this part of the timeline later. Anyway, Gabby decided to confront Trisha about what she had heard from DiMartino, and this confrontation is what caused Trisha to make a video about her. Gabby would later admit that she was looking for a reason to confront Trisha. I heard from a friend that she was telling people that I begged her to come to her house and write for her, and that she said, bitch, I don't know you, you're a psycho, like I'm not giving you my address, and this isn't a first time occurrence, and again, this is just embarrassing and petty, and this video came down to just me being angry and hurt and upset, because from where I was sitting, I've offered her nothing but love and kindness, and for years I've just heard these things that she's said about me behind my back, and just frankly, it hurt. So again, if I'm being a completely 100% honest here, I was looking for a reason to confront Trisha. Usually when somebody comes to me and says, hey, I just think you should know Trisha said this about you, I say, I mean, can I ask her about it? And they say, no, please don't tell her. I don't want to be involved. So when somebody finally said, yeah, just don't get me in trouble, I was like, okay, I can finally confront her about this. But before DiMartino released her statement, she tweeted somewhat of an apology, in which she wrote, I hope everything can be fixed somehow, and I really do believe I am the bad guy, but it was truly unintentional. I'm super uncomfortable, but really want to try to fix what I started. She would later tweet that Trisha manipulated her into tweeting her apology because Trisha knew she would do anything to get her to still like her. She also pointed out how although things seemed to be fine when Trisha was texting her, Trisha continued to put her on blast publicly on Twitter, writing, Clarify, it wasn't on set. It was when I was sleeping over. You talked plenty of shit on two of your former YouTube friends. I told you something in private, and you told Gabby something completely different. I don't know you, so it was my mistake to tell you anything personal. When you examine the timestamps on the pictures DiMartino posted, you can see that only a few minutes after Trisha responds to her privately, they're publicly blasting her apology. It's worth pointing out that DiMartino lives in Pennsylvania, so there's a time difference of three hours. Trisha deleted this tweet later, although it's still available on the Wayback Machine. They would also post on Instagram about the situation, writing, Gabby Hanna is so delusional. She thinks Gabby D said yes when she clearly said no. Like what? They made two more posts, in which they circled a text message sent by DiMartino in which she says, No, I don't want to be involved. Trisha captioned one of the posts, She literally said no. If you gun bring receipts, bring them all. However, Trisha did not bring all of the receipts, considering they failed to include the text message that shows DiMartino telling Gabby, You can do what you want, but send my screenshot if you say anything. And DiMartino herself has said that she told Gabby she could bring it up to Trisha, as long as Gabby didn't say her name. Here's Trisha reading out what they said to DiMartino. I go on to say that's the craziest thing. I did talk shit. I said it to her face. I said it in my video. She's the lowest form of a human being. She is disgusting, abusive, and psychotic. She harasses me. At least say the truth. Like, f you talked shit on blah, 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 blah. Should I tell them? And then another thing. Should I text her? Maybe make a video? Like, I'm doing all this. Like, I guess that's what we do. Just share information we share. Not trying to start shit. Just gonna blast you. That's all. DiMartino replied, seriously? To which Trisha responded, that's what you just told me. DiMartino would then ask, why are you threatening me? I'm just trying to say sorry and asking what I can do. 
Gabby tweeted about the situation, defending DiMartino against Trisha. My beautiful, amazing, sweet friend Gabby DiMartino just called me sobbing because Trisha threatened her to make a post. She's terrified and broken. This is crossing a line. Gabby does not deserve this. She told her if she doesn't make a post, she's to expose all of her secrets. She's living in fear and being blackmailed into defending Trisha. She does not deserve this. She's such a gentle, beautiful, generous, loving soul. Since DiMartino was pretty flustered during the whole ordeal, I can understand how she can interpret this message to be threatening. Although, I don't believe this was Trisha engaging in blackmail. I just saw it as another way of saying, I bet you wouldn't like it if I did this to you. And because Trisha was pretty angry about the situation, it would make sense that they would ask rhetorical questions such as, should I tell them? Should I text her? Maybe make a video? Here's their explanation. So what I was saying, which maybe this is the part that she's like, she's blackmailing me, but this is all after she admitted she lied and stuff like that. Anyways, it's fine. And if she wanted to tell her friend what I was talking shit, like that's fine, but be honest about what I said. Um, so that's why I said that. And I was like, she's like, oh, seriously, I said, that's just what you told me. She goes, why are you threatening me? So that's where that comes in. I'm just trying to say sorry and asking what I can do. I said, you unintentionally started this by talking about me. It's not a threat. That's just what you told me. Like that I was just reiterating her like logic. Like, so I can just, I should just tell this person what you said. Like, that's just normal. That like, that's not starting shit. That's just like, oh yeah, by the way, this person said this about you. Though you could interpret Trisha saying, just going to blast you. That's all as a threat that Trisha is going to expose DiMartino's secrets. However, if we go by Trisha's explanation that they were just reiterating DiMartino's logic, then the more sensible explanation to me would be that Trisha was being sarcastic and mocking DiMartino, or at least what she said. So basically, I think what happened is DiMartino interpreted Trisha's text as a genuine threat, as opposed to just Trisha reiterating DiMartino's logic. I think a similar thing happened with another one of Trisha's messages to DiMartino, in which they say to her, maybe make a video? For context, throughout DiMartino's conversation with Trisha, she kept asking how she should address it publicly, and suggested the idea of making a video. She goes, if you want me to make a video, if you want me to make a video, call me in a little, and she keeps, keeps bringing this up. I said, I'm not asking you to anything. So DiMartino likely interpreted what Trisha texted as Trisha passive-aggressively insinuating that the best course of action DiMartino could take is to make a video. To be fair though, none of this is immediately obvious upon reading the text messages. I can honestly see how DiMartino came to the conclusion that Trisha was threatening her. Since Trisha brought up the fact that DiMartino was talking shit, and then shortly after sent the text messages saying, maybe make a video, and just gonna blast you. You have to consider the somewhat ambiguous wording of Trisha's texts, and the fact that emotions were already running high on both ends. Also, you have to keep in mind that compared to in-person conversations, text messages just hit different. What Trisha told DiMartino could definitely come off as menacing if you say it a certain way. You talk shit on them. Should I tell them? Should I text them? Maybe make a video? Like I guess that's just what we do. Share information we share. I'm not trying to start shit, just gonna blast you. That's all. And to explore all the possibilities of the situation, if you were to interpret Trisha's message in which they say, just gonna blast you, as literally as possible, you would also have to consider that it's directly preceded by Trisha stating that they're, quote, not trying to start shit. And they never did expose who DiMartino was gossiping about. So in this interpretation, what Trisha was referring to as blasting might just be what they were already doing, which was chastising DiMartino over text. So, to summarize, there's three ways you could interpret this. A. Trisha threatening to expose DiMartino's secrets. B. Trisha being sarcastic in an attempt to make a point. Or C. Trisha clarifying they don't want to start shit, but will still chastise DiMartino. The reason I believe it's B more than A is because the claim DiMartino makes is that Trisha is threatening to expose her secrets if she doesn't make a video. A claim that Gabby reinforced on Twitter. Yet this doesn't seem to be the case. In fact, Gabby ended up deleting the tweets accusing Trisha of blackmail, as she posted on Twitter, deleting everything and moving on. Regardless of what people may say or feel, I don't involve myself in internet drama. I don't pick fights, I don't expose people. I make videos where I do chores and laugh with my best friend, I hang out with my boyfriend, I write music. I don't bring up others for clicks. In this case, someone made a video about me and I stooped to a level I rarely if ever stoop to, responding. 
I found myself in a situation of being someone's drama of the week and it's exhausting and a waste of time. Back to hanging with my friends and making music and shit. At the time, people assumed that the reason Gabby backed down was because Trisha said they spoke to their lawyers and shared an email they sent them, in which they wrote, Gabby Hanna has been harassing me for the past few years on social media. I have made a video about this as I'm genuinely scared for my safety. Please, can you communicate with her or her lawyer? I can't deal with this. I need a restraining order ASAP or some sort of protection from someone slandering my name. However, several months later, Gabby claimed there was never actually any type of legal action taken against her. She gave a reason why she chose to stop engaging with the drama. There was a lot of speculation that the reason I wasn't addressing this was because there was a restraining order or a gag order and that wasn't the case. There was never any type of legal action taken against me. I chose to stop responding for the reason that I posted on Twitter, which is this just isn't what I like to do. I got carried away. I got lost in the heat of the moment. I lost my cool and I really lost my cool when my friend Gabby called me crying and I snapped. And then I reeled it back in and I chose to stop responding. A little over a month later, in the infamous episode of her podcast, she revealed that Trisha sent her a cease and desist, which is essentially a cautionary notice threatening legal action. This was likely sent because Gabby addressed her in the video titled Jesse Smiles, Trisha Paytas, Alex James, and Beyonce. But back to Demartino's claim that she was being threatened. Considering the circumstances, I can see why Gabby immediately took her word for it. Typically, if your good friend calls you on the phone crying, your instinct isn't to immediately try to fact check what they're saying. Also, if Gabby already believed Trisha was blackmailing Demartino, then seeing Trisha continue to blast Demartino publicly after seemingly making up with her over text would just make Gabby more suspicious. Around this time, Gabby posted on Instagram to defend herself by showing that she stopped texting Trisha after they asked her to. However, Trisha then posted four instances in which they asked Gabby to stop texting them. On the surface, this looks like it paints a pretty conclusive picture of Gabby's refusal to leave Trisha alone. However, let's examine this more closely, as there's a bit of nuance to consider. In the first instance, you can see that right after Trisha asks Gabby to not text them, they attached an image of a text conversation between Gabby and Demartino to try to prove their point about how Demartino stated she didn't want to be involved. This is a moot point by the way because as I went over earlier, Demartino eventually said it was fine for Gabby to confront Trisha, as long as Gabby left her name out of it. But besides that, this first instance of Trisha asking Gabby to not text them establishes a pattern that we'll see play out in the later instances, of Trisha saying things to Gabby that warrant a response and then telling her immediately after to leave them alone. Gabby responded, I asked Gabby because I've been hearing so much lately. And after I heard about you saying I begged to write you a song after that convo we had about, and then the screenshot cuts out there. Furthermore, you can see that in between Trisha's second and third requests for Gabby to leave them alone, there are texts in which they claim to not talk about Gabby to anyone, and that Demartino brought Gabby up. Not only does this not give Gabby a fair chance to respond, but it's also not true when Trisha tells Gabby they don't talk about her to anyone. I said, I don't talk about you anyone because I don't think about you ever. I did talk shit. I said it to her face. I said it in my video. Asking every single person I hang out with if I talk shit about her, knowing very well that I do talk shit about her. There are also these clips. Make of them what you will. I don't just go up and start talking shit about you to people. And if I did, it was because that person also was. I don't even think I was talking shit because I told her to her face. I said it in a DM. Of all the people I've talked shit about her to, no one has ever repeated it to her. So there's been three people. And when I say talk shit, I tell a story. If that's talking shit, that's the only thing I ever have on against Gabby. However, despite the fact Trisha talked about her, you could make the argument that Gabby still should have just left it at that and stopped responding. But how many people would really be willing to abruptly walk away from a tense emotional confrontation in which the other person is spewing unchecked falsehoods? And then we have the fourth and last instance, in which Trisha says, Please leave me alone. Go away. To which Gabby responds, Did I tweet it? Talk about it? When you examine the text messages that were previously sent, it looks like what happened was that Gabby and Trisha were sending each other multiple text messages at the same time, and they ended up overlapping. This would be supported by the fact that Gabby's messages around this time all follow the same pattern. They're all rhetorical questions with the phrase, did I? Such as, did I spread a rumor? Or, did I tell the one person it concerned to talk to you about it, as an adult? Did I go and tell everyone you know? Did I tweet it? Talk about it? This would also be confirmed by Gabby herself here. I have those texts where I'm just like, stop texting me, like just stop you texting me. 
me. Like, like, and I said it multiple I didn't, times. I didn't think that was super fair either because like when we were texting, we were both texting at the same time. So like, and I'm like, can we just end we, this? Stop it. Because I but like you were able to say whatever you wanted, and then when I responded, the the response was like, you're harassing me. And it's like so you can no. make this accusation, but if I respond, then I'm harassing yeah, but you. You are you are very a paranoid person. And unless there's more to this conversation that isn't shown in the screenshot then it's a bit of a stretch to count this as an instance of Gabby being told to leave Trisha alone, but simply refusing to do so. Also, if we go by the texts Gabby showed in her video, she pretty much only texted supportive things. And asking Trisha's friends if Trisha is talking about her doesn't necessarily constitute harassment, in my opinion. And she kept harassing people I knew in real life. Trisha just talked shit, Trisha just talked shit, and then I just, I couldn't take it anymore because she was just lying. DiMartino denied that the drama was a setup orchestrated by her and Gabby. And apparently Trisha married a cardboard cutout because they were bored? Well, this is America, so go nuts. Trisha had this to say after the fact. I was really, really, really mad at Gabby DiMartino, but I was trying to be nice to her and cordial to her, especially online. I wasn't trying to attack her because it just, my issues weren't with her. And they're still not really. It was just more of like, wow, that was kind of weird that you said that because like that's something I kind of told you in private, you know what I mean? Trisha also makes sure to emphasize that they see Gabby as a quote Scary, scary, scary individual. Scary. In fact, Trisha repeatedly says that they have told Gabby why they don't like her and how they are scared of Gabby. It gives me like chills in like a way that I've never felt before when I've like spoken my truth about someone. This is like scary, like actually scary. You are actually evil and actually scary and I pray for your well-being that something serious, some serious shit does not happen in the sense of you getting in trouble for this shit, for talk, like talking about blackmail, about people, like lying on people. From the way Trisha talks about her, you'd think she did something really bad, instead of just wanting to know if Trisha was talking negatively about her. And when you keep on hearing about how someone you like is talking shit about you, and in this case, someone you've only ever shown kindness to, then it's only natural that you would be curious and want to know what this person said about you. Now, if the problem was just that Trisha was saying mean things about her, then I would agree with people who say that Gabby should have just let it go. But again, Trisha didn't just express their dislike for Gabby, they also perpetuated a misleading narrative about Gabby telling people they had herpes. I'm not sure if Gabby was just hearing from people that Trisha was talking shit, or if she was also hearing from people that Trisha was characterizing her as a rumor monger. Anyhow, the feud would continue throughout 2020, and a video uploaded in May titled Jesse Smiles, Trisha Paytas, Alex James, and Beyonce, Gabby publicly addressed the situation with Trisha on her channel, making it the first time she discussed it on YouTube. She said that she wishes she handled the situation differently and that she was sorry that she hurt Trisha, even going as far as to give a public message to them that if they ever feel alone, that she's there for them, and that she wants to see them win and be happy, and would always cheer them on. So it seems like things should be coming to an end at this point. Gabby had already said she was sorry she hurt Trisha, and even offered to be there for them if they ever felt alone. But unfortunately, it doesn't end there. Shortly after posting this video, Gabby would soon undergo a public mental health crisis. She would go on multiple live streams broken and visibly distressed, and would film the podcast I had mentioned earlier, which would become infamous for her emotional outburst, and these clips in particular. You all of these people for what they've done to me. And for them to be tweeting right now, I'm playing the victim. I am the victim. These are bullies. These are high school bullies. But although you might be tempted to say Gabby is just playing the victim, let's take a look at her side of the story first. As you can probably tell, Gabby's very emotional and visibly frustrated throughout this episode. She's basically discussing a lot of the things that were frustrating her at the time regarding the public's perception of her. And one of the things discussed was the Trisha Paytas situation. In her podcast, several months after Trisha's video, Gabby provided further insight that may help us understand her perspective more clearly. I reached out to Dustin because he was always really nice to me about like my music and stuff and I thought we were friendly. So I was like, hey, like before this turns into a big thing because I'm literally actively trying to avoid drama, can we like talk and can I tell you my story? And this I, is about? Trisha. Might as well just say it, right? Okay. Like we're here. like. Should I just like go and like, I try not to bring people's names into it, but like, this is serious shit. 
He called me, we FaceTimed. I was like crying. I was also laughing. Like it was just talking. I was like, I'm just frustrated, dude. Like it's this rumor that she's been telling everybody. Like I swear she meets people and says, Gabby, do you like Gabby Hanna? She tells everybody I have herpes, which I don't. So I told him that he's like, yeah, you know what? I met her at the Grove and within the first like five minutes of meeting you or meeting her, she asked, do I like you? And said that, I spread rumors about her having herpes. So like, I totally understand what you're saying because like, I'm basically confirming what you're saying. Like, I totally get why you'd feel like that way. Like this experience happened to Yeah. You. And then, I mean, this was in the podcast that we didn't end up posting, but like Gabby admitted to me, she was like, one of the first things Trisha did was ask, are you cool with Gabby? And started saying that rumor. And then when Gabby, or no, she didn't tell Gabby at first, Gabby said, yeah, she's my friend. And then she went into the green room and started talking about me in the green room, like the producers and stuff were saying what was going on. Like, yeah, she's like saying this thing about like, Gabby tells everyone she has herpes. Like nobody fucking asked. However, there is something I need to point out, although it might just be semantics. At this point in time, there doesn't seem to be any solid evidence of Gabby's claim that Trisha said Gabby tells everyone that they have herpes. Like I swear she meets people and says, Gabby, do you like Gabby Hanna? She tells everybody I have herpes. It is unknown if Trisha has made this claim in private, and such a thing would probably be impossible to prove 100%. Maybe it's hyperbole, but only Gabby would truly know. Trisha did make the claim that Gabby told multiple people, and she said it in front of multiple people, not just him. But that was a little less than two weeks after this podcast. And whether or not you think that's a fair statement at all depends on if you consider two people to be multiple people. More on that later. Shortly after the release of this podcast episode, Trisha bashed Gabby on Instagram. I just want to say Gabby Hanna is a piece of shit. Gabby Hanna, you need help. Your biggest fear is that you think you're crazy. You are. Here is your sign. You are surrounded by people so far up your ass that they're not telling you to get the f off the internet and get some help because you are delusional. The fact that you say you never bring anyone's name, you hate bringing my name into it, you hate, you hate starting drama. You did it back then. You do it to every single person. You are actually delusional. You are so scary delusional. The fact that you don't think you started any drama, you, there's all your Instagram story of you starting the drama by sharing my name in them. You are scary delusional. Get off the internet, stop talking and get some help. You are crazy obsessive with me. It's scary. My cease and desist was a very polite way of you're scary. Leave me the f alone. I'm going to let someone legally know your harassment of me and that I'm having issues with you. And I'm publicly letting people know that I'm having issues with you because you are scary, obsessive, and obviously delusional. It's worth repeating that Gabby was not in a good headspace at the time. Several days before the podcast, Gabby went on a live stream and claimed that YouTube had shadow banned her. She was upset that her music video wasn't trending and said that her previous ones had trended in the past. And there's evidence that supports this. However, she believes that as a result of the drama she was involved in at the time, her channel had been shadow banned, and her music video was suppressed as a result. When Gabby talked about this, she garnered a lot of negative attention, with many people criticizing her for what they perceived to be entitlement, narcissism, and getting upset about something that's relatively unimportant compared to the more serious issues going on. For instance, well-known commentator Kavos made a video about the situation titled, Gabby Hanna is pathetic, crying over views. But Gabby doesn't only feel entitled to views, no, 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 she feels that YouTube owe her the trending page. You know the page that most creators never get on, don't even get a sniff of, even if they have the viewership to hit trending, don't get trending because they're not favored by YouTube. But that's just YouTube. People have accepted that. But unlike Gabby, we all don't go around screaming like YouTube is trying to silence us because we haven't made the trending page. Can you not comprehend that your music video just didn't do as well on YouTube as other platforms? Although I can see why Gabby may have come off as entitled, it's a petty thing to criticize considering that she also stated in live streams at the time that she recently came close to ending her own life. I was literally on the brink of suicide. You want to kill yourself because there's no escape. So excuse my anger and my emotions and my passions when you're on the brink of suicide. This was put in front of Susan, in front of YouTube executives, and they knew the issue, and they knew that I was on the brink of suicide because I let them know. She also mentioned this on Twitter. I understand that the internet is not a very nice place, and that being a public figure means being criticized, 
But when someone, in this case Gabby, just two days earlier talked on livestream about how she almost ended her own life and tweeted about it on the 15th, how can you post a video on the 16th called Gabby Hanna is pathetic? It's possible that Kavos and the other people who commented on the situation were not aware that Gabby had said these things, but it was still unnecessary to be that harsh on her, especially over something so petty. What many people spectating the situation did not take into account was the broader context of why she was so upset. In a video she uploaded after returning from her mental health break, she explained that it was a buildup of years of suffering. She talks about her involvement with a toxic, abusive friend group, who she describes as very mentally and emotionally abusive, sometimes even physically. She then goes into detail about how they would make demeaning comments about her weight and appearance. And even if you don't like Gabby, if you claim to be against body shaming, then you should apply that standard to everybody. But unfortunately, it gets worse. She also talks about how this group of people was very controlling of her and her relationships, and she would constantly be afraid that she wouldn't have a place to stay. Then it started progressing really quickly to controlling my relationships, telling me I couldn't talk to certain people, telling people that they couldn't talk to me, and... If I broke the rules, then I had to face this wrath. Like, I would get phone calls from people saying that this person called them screaming, saying that they can't talk to me anymore, or a friend once called me crying because they told them some lie to make them hate me. They kept threatening to kick me out. Sometimes you make me feel really, really great about myself and make me feel like I have a home and a friend here and I'm the best friend you ever had, but then you also treat me like shit and hurt my feelings all the time and every day I'm afraid I'm gonna be homeless and I don't have anywhere else to go right now because you won't let me have any other friends and I can't afford a place on my own so I was just always feeling isolated and controlled and trapped. Gabby also states that she had to deal with threats and blackmail. The threats, the blackmail, the harassment, the smear campaigns, they followed me for years and ultimately it really f***ed me up fin financially and professionally but mostly mentally because all I wanted was to be left alone, and it felt like there was nothing I could do to just be left alone. According to Gabby, these people have made an active effort to ruin the positive events in her life. And she tried to handle things privately, but it got too overwhelming and ended up taking a heavy toll on her mental health. In fact, things had gotten so bad at that point that she started to look into a potential lawsuit. However, after being informed by her lead litigator that she would have to commit to two or three years of a lawsuit, Gabby decided that she didn't want to spend more of her time and energy on these people. Gabby also described a particularly scary incident, in which she and her boyfriend Peyton had returned home after seeing the grocery store was closed, only to find a man outside her house with what appeared to be spy equipment. Gabby was absolutely terrified. The cops were making me feel like I should be really concerned. My security people were having me reset and secure all my Wi-Fi and alarm passwords, and I had a full-blown panic attack uncontrollably sobbing, couldn't sleep for weeks, added locks, added extra security, and who knows? Like, that's the thing, like, who knows if it was real or not? Maybe it was just some guy who needed Wi-Fi and he was driving around looking for it and he had to pull over. Or, I don't know, but like, when there's people threatening to kill you every day, it's not insanely paranoid to think that something might be amiss. She also talks about someone wanting to destroy her and how her phone, which had that information on it, got hacked. There's a lot more to that that I'm not going to get into, but still, every time I get into my car, I worry that my brakes are going to be frayed, or I worry that because I'm so open with the fact that this has pushed me so far mentally that my death would be staged as a suicide. And it's just one of those things that like, yeah, maybe, maybe I'm paranoid, but it's really not that crazy to think that I'm not. So that's where my, what I feel is a genuine fear for my life came from. Gabby also talked about how most of her videos didn't show up on restricted mode and that her channel suffered as a result. One prominent point people brought up is how her channel wasn't actually shadow banned because you could still find it when you searched for it. Gabby justified her reasoning for believing this and brought up how her content before April 2018 wasn't restricted, despite the content being more explicit and inappropriate back then. She insinuates that after her videos started getting bombarded with dislikes and her watch time started to tank, it negatively affected how the algorithm treated her channel. My videos are getting blindly slammed with dislikes. My watch time is now registering as 0.2 seconds because people are coming just to dislike. And my channel is algorithmically showing that people don't like and aren't interested in my content. She also insinuated that the algorithm suppresses content based on its comments, and stated that her comment sections were being filled with certain vile keywords that I can't repeat here. 
but they pretty much refer to some of the worst things possible. It's unclear whether or not this is actually the reason the algorithm favored her content less. While there is a tweet from Team YouTube themselves dated February 2019 that says comments can affect a video's monetization, this was also around the time YouTube was responding to concerns that had developed over content and comments that might endanger minors. It's hard to say because YouTube doesn't reveal everything. Although Gabby did go into detail about how she believes that she was shadow banned, there were multiple things weighing on Gabby, as we've established. This wasn't simply an influencer upset about not getting enough views. This is also someone at a very stressful point in her life publicly undergoing a mental health crisis who saw the considerably lower view count as emblematic of her rapidly deteriorating reputation. And if Gabby truly felt that YouTube was deliberately sabotaging her channel, then it would make sense why she would be so distraught over that, as nobody wants to be unfairly treated. Gabby has stated that this is not about low views or irrelevance. This has never been about low views or not being relevant. Like I've said a million times in a million places, YouTube has peaks and valleys. However, I think a more accurate statement would be that this isn't just about low views or irrelevance. As we've established, there have been multiple things that contributed to her poor mental state. While it's true that most people couldn't have known that these specific things were weighing on her, she was very open about how she felt suicidal. In fact, she even stated in a tweet that she came close to ending her own life, and that people started saying she was losing it and mocked her mental health. At the time, Ashley Kyle uploaded a video with the title, Gabby Hanna Loses It. Yikes. She would later change the title to Gabby Hanna Removed from YouTube? Nick Snyder also uploaded a video titled Gabby Hanna Loses Mind on Twitter Because of This, which he would then change to Gabby Hanna Didn't Like My Original Title. This was also the original thumbnail to the video Kavos made on her. However, the final thumbnail says pathetic instead of losing it. I'm not sure if he decided right before uploading it to go with the one that says pathetic, or if he changed it after the video was already public, but there's also this screenshot showing the original thumbnail while the video was still private. Either way, many people made fun of her around this time. And there's even a compilation called 10 Minutes of TikToks Making Fun of Miss Gabby Hanna. Trisha would also get in on this. Fuck you. Fuck all of these people for what they've done to me. And for them to be tweeting right now, I'm playing the victim. I am the fucking victim. You have abused me and lied. And I'm telling you guys again, there's a fraction that you guys know because I don't show it. It's literally them. And, and that, that is what, what toxic, toxic abusive, abusive people, people do. do. They'll go flat down to you as hard as they can. can. Point the finger, pull the trigger, throw them off your chair. You'll get yours eventually. Sorry you had to see that. I also want to point out that even though Trisha was claiming Gabby was harassing them, Trisha was still constantly mocking Gabby and saying demeaning things about her. Around this time, Trisha tweeted, Gabby needed serious help. I did too this time last year. I truly hope she deleted her social media for peace of mind and also to get some outside perspective. Constant berating is not good on anyone's mental health. Hmm, you don't say. If Trisha was truly concerned about Gabby, then they shouldn't have made fun of her mental health crisis soon after. And if Trisha was truly scared of Gabby like they said multiple times, Scary, scary, scary individual, scary. Then repeatedly mocking her isn't a smart thing to do either. These days, everyone wants to say they support mental health, and there is more awareness about it these days. However, the sheer volume of insults and mockery that surrounded the situation serves as a sobering reminder of the lingering hypocrisy surrounding the topic. Everyone cares about mental health. Unless we're talking about someone you don't like. In which case, who cares, right? People already had a certain image of Gabby in their heads as a narcissistic attention seeker, and so when they were presented with a narrative that she was just throwing a fit over her low view count, they didn't question it or stop to ask about the circumstances that may have led to Gabby going on multiple live streams and shambles. In fact, they went out of their way to dunk on somebody in a clearly vulnerable position. The comments also reveal a pretty troubling way to respond to somebody who's clearly having mental health struggles. Gabby, there are people dying. Get a grip. We're in the midst of a pandemic, and you're bawling over this? Y'all, imagine being in the middle of a pandemic, civil rights revolution, and various other worldwide crises like the famine in Yemen, and having a breakdown over your music video not getting views. First of all, just because there are worse things going on in the world doesn't invalidate your pain. After all, someone's always gonna have it worse than you. 
but you still have a right to feel the way you feel, regardless of anyone else's hardships, and the same applies to Gabby. Second, you have to consider the fact that the pandemic has had a demonstrably negative effect on many people's mental health. Also, I'd argue that seeing somebody so distressed over something that seems relatively trivial is more of a cause of concern than something to get mad at. I think a more productive way to mentally approach this would be to ask, what happened in this person's life that something this small seemed to evoke such a huge reaction? Are there potentially underlying issues that may have played a role in how this person acted? Is there more to the story that I'm not currently aware of? And I don't mean to come off as patronizing, but sometimes it's easy to slip into reaction mode without considering these factors. That's not to say that people are exempt from criticism if they're going through tough times, but the way people reacted was disproportionately vitriolic considering the situation. Also, it's much easier to dehumanize people over social media, since you're not actually physically interacting with them. You don't have to be held accountable to a person who's right in front of you. Around this time, Trisha also uploaded a video titled, Gabby Hanna, Shut the F*** Up, You Are Delusional in which they basically just say a bunch of mean things to Gabby and repeat ad nauseum about how scary Gabby is. You have always been scary delusional to me. You were so scary to me, beyond scary. In fact, this girl's scary delusional. It is at this point that it's scary delusional. Gabby, you are scary. I am so, so f scared of you. You are scary and dangerous. To be fair though, Gabby did say this during a live stream that happened a little bit earlier. The number one person you should be afraid of is somebody who has nothing to lose. And you guys took so much from me, and I have nothing to lose. Now, this is a fairly ominous statement, and it really shows you how bad Gabby's headspace was at the time. So this is actually one instance in which you can genuinely say what's going on is scary. And Trisha makes sure to let us know. She's literally saying, be scared of someone with nothing to lose, and she has nothing to lose. She will end up hurting somebody or herself. This is the darkest thing I've ever seen. This is the scariest I've ever seen someone spiral. And she's not saying it's a troll. She's not snapping out of it. This has been going on for a week straight. However, it's worth noting that Trisha has been calling Gabby scary for months before Gabby said that. Scary, scary, scary individual. Scary. And this still poses the question, why would you go out of your way to relentlessly mock and insult her if you are truly that scared of her? Number one person you should be afraid of. Is somebody, somebody who has nothing to lose. lose. And, and you guys took so, so much from me. And, and I, I have nothing to lose. lose. So. <laughs> this is the darkest thing I've ever seen. This is the scariest I've ever seen someone spiral. One thing Trisha points out is that Gabby didn't mention the fact that David was also there. Her original story was, oh, I told him in private. I confronted a friend in private. Then her second video where she's drumming up drama this past couple months about this, she said, oh, Jason can attest to it, and David was there too. This is true, as evidenced by this clip. What I've always told Jason, and if he wants to, he can back this up. David was there, he can back it up. There are several possible reasons why Gabby did not mention David's involvement at first. It's possible she did not want to involve David in the drama. While she did say that he could back up what she was saying, that was several months after the drama blew up. And she said that in the context of trying to establish credibility for her claims. It's possible that she did not see the point in mentioning all of the details, as she probably did not foresee that the drama would get as big as it did. Also, just because David was there doesn't necessarily mean Gabby's claim that she told Jason in private isn't true. It would still be in private. It would just mean David was there too. Furthermore, it was on Instagram that Gabby first started talking about the situation. So it's also possible that Gabby was just trying to tell a condensed version of the story. After all, explaining that she told Jason in private, but someone else who was close to him was also there and Jason was already telling her about how he had sex with Trisha might be a bit much, or might not have even occurred to her. However, for the sake of objectivity, I also have to acknowledge the possibility that Gabby intentionally left this information out in order to make her side of the story appear more favorable. As I mentioned before, Trisha would claim later on that Gabby told multiple people that they had herpes. And then obviously when I got together with Jason, he told me all that shit. And she said it in front of multiple people, not just him. And I was like, oh, that, that's shady. Who's this bitch, you know? While there's still no evidence to support the fact that Gabby said Trisha had herpes in the first place, some might argue that it is true that Gabby told multiple people, since Jason and David were there. I personally wasn't sure about this, since I would usually consider the word multiple to mean more than two people. 
So I decided to make a poll. 63% of people who voted in my Twitter poll agree that two people can already be considered as multiple people, and 59% of those who voted in my Instagram poll think so as well. So even this claim from Trisha is still pretty debatable. Trisha would also claim that Gabby continued to spread the narrative that they had herpes, which is, of course, flagrantly untrue. Has continu continuously per perpetuated the, the storyline that I have herpes or whatever the f continue continues to do it. On July 2nd, 2020, Trisha posted a nearly 22-minute Instagram story about Gabby. In it, Trisha claims to sincerely want Gabby to seek help, and basically claims to not just be kicking Gabby when she's down. I sincerely hope it, she, she like gets help. Like, I sincerely, this isn't like, let me come down on her in her time of crisis. Like, no, I, I had to call her out because she was calling me a liar. This was also around the time that Gabby's angry rant during her podcast went viral. So Trisha had this to say about that. This should be taken down because this is very scary. She's yelling into a microphone on a podcast. It's extremely manic aggressive. Shortly after this Instagram story in which Trisha claims to not be coming down on Gabby during her time of crisis, Trisha posted a TikTok mocking Gabby. Keep in mind, this was only four days after calling Gabby scary and claiming to not be coming down on her. I guess it's technically accurate, since at the time of recording the Instagram story, Trisha was less aggressive. In fact, Trisha actually waited a whole four days to start kicking Gabby while she was down. How considerate. Six days after that TikTok, Trisha posted another one. It doesn't make much sense to openly and repeatedly mock someone who you claim to be scared of. It's important to point out for context that Gabby, at this point in time, was taking a six-week break from social media for the sake of her mental health. So it's not even like Gabby was saying stuff about Trisha at this time to provoke them. This is literally just Trisha kicking someone while she's down. Gabby mentioned at the end of her comeback video that she had a new song coming out that was written about Trisha and for Trisha. The first single from my f***ing album is coming out next month. I've been working on that in the music video, and it was actually written about Trisha Paytas for Trisha Paytas, but I'll talk about that and explain that in another video. So Trisha's response was to make this TikTok. These are bullies! High school f***ing bullies! They captioned it, Me finding out Gabby Hanna's new song is about me. Gabby would soon react to it in a video she uploaded on September 6th, 2020, titled, Gabby Hanna Reacts to Mean Gabby Hanna TikToks. I just want to say something before, so it doesn't like start like Whoa. with Trisha. Wait, was I, that was Trisha? It was Trisha, yeah. I don't get offended when Trisha does stuff like this because like that's kind of what her brand is. She does it to a lot of people. It's not like she's just singling me out. My only thing that was kind of confusing when I see that is just sort of like, where's the empathy? As somebody who I know that she's very open with having like mental health struggles. So seeing her kind of take that and mock with it, it's just sort of, confusing because I know that she understands what it feels like but I don't get like offended or like hurt or anything when Trisha does it if anything it's just like kind of part of being on the internet you know what I mean Gabby's video as a whole was criticized with one of the most prominent criticisms people had being that the videos she and her friends were reacting to weren't actually mean at all four days later Keemstar would invite her to appear on drama alert and she would discuss her drama with Trisha and the fact that she was making a song about Trisha Although the title of the video was Gabby Hanna Makes a Trisha Paytas Diss Track, this would turn out to just be a clickbait title. As Gabby clarified that the song was not intended to be a diss track and was actually intended to be sung by Trisha. But Gabby decided to just sing it herself since Trisha wasn't using it. Gabby also stated on Drama Alert that she was sorry that she caused Trisha pain, and that she apologized to Trisha over the internet, because the night that they got into it, Trisha asked Gabby to not contact them. So, it's reasonable to assume that what Gabby was referring to when she mentions apologizing over the internet was her video titled, Jesse Smiles, Trisha Paytas, Alex, James, and Beyonce. Furthermore, Gabby said Trisha texted and called her. She has texted and called me a couple times and asked me to call her uh, within the last like couple weeks or so. I haven't, um, just because I don't think that it would be a healthy or productive conversation, but um, Obviously, I, I, I don't harbor any ill feelings, like, genuinely. Like, I don't want to see her burn right. or be hurt. When you consider everything Gabby actually said in the interview, she didn't say anything provocative or inflammatory. However, the mere fact that she appeared on a show called Drama Alert rubbed many people the wrong way. 
as they saw it as directly contradicting the many times she said she didn't want to be involved in drama. Although nothing Gabby said was provocative, I can see why her appearing on Drama Alert would be bad optics. But despite Gabby's willingness to reconcile the relationship, Trisha did not feel the same way, and would put out a video on the same day, titled, Gabby Hanna, Leave Me Alone, You're f***ing Creepy As Hell. The irony of Trisha's claim that Gabby wouldn't leave them alone wasn't lost on the viewers, as commenters pointed out that Trisha was being hypocritical, considering Trisha has made many videos and TikToks about her. Trisha would also say that it was embarrassing to be associated with Gabby. It's embarrassing to be associated with you. It's so embarrassing. I feel so bad for the people who have collabs with you. It's embarrassing. If it's so embarrassing, then why make multiple videos with her name in the title? As one commenter put it, If it's so embarrassing being associated with her, then don't make a video associating yourself with her. Trisha denied Gabby's claim that they texted her. She just said yes, Trisha has asked me to text her. Oh, bitch, where? Bitch, when? Oh my god, bitch, where, bitch, when? As my boyfriend, one time you called me, came up as Gabby Ignore, and I was just like, oh, like, I got scared. I was like, oh, why is she calling me? And I was assuming it was a butt dial up. Bitch, when did I? Trisha also implies that they fear for their own safety, which is a recurring talking point of theirs. On Twitter, Gabby posted a screenshot of a comment she wrote addressing Trisha. She clarified that she didn't have bad intentions and that the video she was going to post about the song wouldn't be hurtful. In fact, she even offered to let Trisha watch the video first so that she could make modifications if Trisha was not comfortable. The day after the Drama Alert interview and Trisha's video came out, Keemstar went on Twitter and had this to say. Texted Trisha trying to better understand her side with this Gabby stuff and she lashed out on me via text and blocked me. On text blocked me. Worried about Trisha, she's sounding like a conspiracy theorist, nut emoji. She was telling me something that was impossible to believe. And the day after that, Keemstar went on a Twitter rant criticizing how the T-Channel spill sesh covered the situation, with his main point being about how drama channels didn't cover the full context of how Trisha provoked Gabby, and how they also didn't properly hold Trisha accountable. When you're sitting there and you're reading all these tweets from Trisha saying, uh, Trisha said, leave me alone, and Gabby's a stalker, and Gabby's stalking me. When you're reading all those tweets and you leave all the context out that Trisha has been bullying and making fun and making these TikToks nonstop, it makes Gabby look like a stalker. Like you're deliberately taking a big piece of the pie out of your story, out of your video that shows that Trisha Paytas is a lunatic, that Trisha Paytas is claiming Gabby is stalking her when really Trisha Paytas is making multiple TikToks, multiple videos, multiple tweets, even when Gabby's on a break and she left the internet, Trisha Paytas is talking about Gabby Hanna nonstop. Why is that not in your video? Around this time, Gabby also uploaded a video talking about the song she had written for Trisha. It's mainly just her talking about her passion for songwriting and how excited she was to be writing a song for Trisha. She also shows clips from past videos where Trisha is singing her songs or acting like a fan of hers. Gabby also pulls up text conversations of her and Trisha discussing the Jason Ash STD situation, as well as some messages showing Trisha praising Gabby, and that Trisha is willing to let Gabby write a song for them. Since this is a video talking about the origin of a song she wrote for and about Trisha, Gabby was talking about how she was trying to write from their perspective. And so Gabby also talks about how she thinks Trisha projects their insecurities onto others and deflects. I think that she projects her insecurities onto others and deflects a lot. I think that she masks her own insecurities by being really flamboyant and over the top and, you know, the clothes and the shoes, the nails, the tanning, the cars, the fashion, the bragging about the money. I think a lot of people would look at that and say that she's vain and self-obsessed. But I have a feeling and a hunch that it's actually insecurity. This part of the video did end up rubbing people the wrong way. To provide some further context, before the section, Gabby was describing Trisha's personality and self-image. One major thing about her is she doesn't like to take herself too seriously. She loves joking about herself and her personality and her different types of personality traits. She refers to herself as a hot mess and owns the fact that she is a hot mess. Like, I think she really tries to own that whole, like, I'm a fucking mess vibe. She is super theatrical and high energy in her performances. Now, to be fair to some of the commenters, I can see why somebody would think that this part that I'm about to play is a little strange, since she does end up bringing something up that definitely portrays Trisha in a negative light. 
For example, there's one story in somebody's vlog where Trisha admits to blocking the door so that Jason can't leave. She sat right here. She sat here like a prison guard. And I was like, Trisha, get out of the way. I'm going home. I want to go home. I need some time to myself. She's like, no, no. Holy sh**. Is like, this true? Yeah. So when I saw that clip back when I was writing the song, I thought this could be a really powerful moment and image because this is something that I'm assuming Trisha is not particularly proud of. And I think that it's something that she probably feels misunderstood about. So I wanted to give her the opportunity to flip that into something artistic and positive and really own it and take it back instead of letting people just bring it up over and over to bash her. However, considering everything that went down, Gabby is actually fairly charitable in the way she describes Trisha in this video. But over the years, I've heard her say, yes, I'm toxic, yes, I'm crazy, and yes, she hurts people, but below it all, it's love. And she's somebody who just wants to give her all and all of her love to people. If she loves you, she'll give you anything. And I really don't think that Trisha wants to hurt people. I don't think she likes to be viewed as a villain. I don't think she wakes up every day and says, I want people to not like me today. I think that she just overall wants to protect herself and she feels like hurting others sometimes is the only way to do that. Reject before you get rejected, hurt before you get hurt, ruin them before you're ruined. And I'm not saying that I like it or it feels good or that it's okay. I'm saying that I can empathize. It is toxic and it is wrong, but what I see in all of that lashing out is a lot of misdirected pain and anger as a result of feeling so misunderstood for so long. Assuming there's no passive-aggressive intention in the video, this is a pretty compassionate way of talking about someone who literally mocked her during one of her lowest points. Although it's worth noting that Gabby's goodwill towards Trisha had evaporated in 2021 after a failed attempt at reconciliation. Three days after she posted her video explaining the origin of her song Call Me Crazy, she'd post another video called I Was Wrong, which was basically just a screenshot of a Patreon post in which she stated how this song was basically her trying to make the most of a bad situation. She also apologized for sending mixed messages and acknowledged that her actions weren't aligning with her words. While many people thought Gabby was being passive-aggressive throughout the video and that she was even gaslighting Trisha, it also just seems like people are predisposed to adopting the most uncharitable position on whatever Gabby says and does. Considering the number of like videos and TikToks that she has done as a way to try and hurt me kind of repeatedly, I just feel like I deserve to be able to talk about my music and give context to the song and tell the story of my music and where it came from, just like any artist with any song. She has a point. As she stated in the video, it's like people could take hits at her, but as soon as she responds, it's considered stirring the pot or playing the victim. However, I do personally think that making the video in the first place was a questionable decision, especially considering that it involves someone who has very openly attacked Gabby multiple times. Making a video in which you're talking at length about someone who dislikes you usually isn't going to go well with that person, especially when you are discussing their negative traits, even if you're trying to put a positive spin on things. On the contrary though, while it can be seen as Gabby instigating drama, it's also worth pointing out that Gabby has always talked about the origins and backstories of her songs on her channel, and she shouldn't have to stop doing that just because this song in particular is about someone who's no longer on good terms with her. As Gabby herself puts it, for me to ignore this part of my life or ignore the story behind what I'm writing about and what I'm talking about would be inauthentic. And when somebody's kind of coming at you like that and putting you down, there's two paths. You can get mad or you can get inspired. Trisha fueled the flames a little more, but eventually everything started to calm down. Until it didn't. Hey guys, welcome back to Burnout. This is the the crossover nobody expected. We were like friends, like yeah. we talked about relationships. And she said she was cutting out so many things because she goes, you're right, that didn't happen. The reason I made the video is because she put my name out on the Instagram story first. She vehemently up and down denied that that happened. But her story is that we were never friends and that she never knew me. And then I'm delusional and imagined a friendship. And I think that's up. I really don't know how I've been a shit person to Gabby other than try and like, just like, deal with like the anger I had towards her for lying about having her bees. I thought by blocking this person I set boundaries that I just please can you leave me alone please she's allowed to do all of those things but if I dare say that I'm gonna share the truth she sobs in her car and begs to be left alone it feels like it doesn't stop you also made me suicidal and I've made that really clear I just scratched the surface like the real shit's like to come 
you are scary, you are crazy, you are delusional. You will never be me. Because you're a character online that I talk about, Gabby. But I'm not a character, I'm a human being. You are literally ruining people's lives and spreading lies. Like you are literally a life ruining tabloid. I initially planned on covering even more about the Trisha situation in this video, but then more and more just kept coming out. So I had to stop at some point because it just became way too much. I'm just a man! I'm a small man. And after the hundreds of hours and several months it took to make this, I most likely will not continue. If you've made it this far into the video, thank you so much. If you'd like to support the production of these videos, then I'll leave a link to my Patreon in the description, where you can also get access to extra content. Pretty cool beans, if you ask me. Also, be sure to follow me on Twitter and Instagram, I'm very interactive on those platforms. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. It's alright if I